Hey ho, here we are with Dave Connor of API 3 Dow. You might want to turn your camera on, Dave, or... I think it is on. Okay. Um, Can you not see me? No, I can't. Have you granted permissions in... in yeah, Chrome I can see myself in here. Oh, okay. Strange. Anthony, is it... Uh, you seeing everybody? He can see both of us. Oh, there we go. Hey, man. Hey. So I'm curious. Does does what is what does uh, Trevet mean? Trevet? Oh, the yeah. vet. So yeah, your Twitter your Twitter name is the vet. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, in my days before blockchain, I was a vet, so I'm a qualified veterinarian as well. So oh, a veterinarian, my, not a veteran. Yeah, yeah. No, not a veteran. My Twitter account is pretty old. It's from 2009. So I've been fairly lazy at keeping it updated and following people, and I, I very rarely tweet from it. But you asked for a Twitter account, so there it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like spreading the love and giving people a way to, to, to connect with others. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, that's I not what I thought. It. I thought it was the vet. I figured you were like an ex-military guy, you know. But no, it's, would have never um, come upon a veterinarian. Yeah, it's it's not the common entry into crypto, a veterinarian to blockchain. But I used to do a bit of advertising, um, lead analysis, software research on the side, and I kind of came onto blockchain back in 2013, really, when Dogecoin. Uh, first entered the public consciousness. That was really fun, man. We had an app where you could just like by by Bluetooth, you could you could you could flick coins at each yeah. other. I, and there that? was an app where it kind of rains Doge coins as well, and you had to click on them, and then that gave you real Doge. I remember those. Yeah. Yeah, um, man, that was like that was about the level of my involvement with Doge. <laughs> yeah, it was it was the fun side of blockchain, but then I think coming on from that. I stayed interested enough that I kind of followed the evolution, the, the early stages of kind of creating tokens on blockchains, the original colored coins on Bitcoin and the Doge equivalents of Doge party, which ended up not amounting to too much. And then master the, coin, colored coins. Those are some early, that's those are some really some early day stuff. Yeah. 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 So it was really interesting following that and then seeing Ethereum emerge and creating a, a very usable smart contract platform. But even then, still, it the early uses of smart contracts on Ethereum weren't that interesting to me. It was kind of just creating tokens and fairly niche games. So I think I became most interested in blockchain around 2017, 2018, when the rise of um, the Oracle projects really led to the possibility of external data being used in smart contracts. And I've always been passionate about fully decentralizing everything. Uh, What's the I name think, of the? What was the Oracle project that got a good ICO? Uh, the Gnosis so, peak. What was the first one? The big. Uh, Augur was. Augur, that's yeah. what it was. I was like going, hey, 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 yeah, Augur. Was that that was the uh, the the light bulb moment? Yeah, so Augur was uh, it was actually Chainlink. I think for me was the light bulb moment for the white paper there because um, Augur and Kleros and um, Option Room are, are kind of three. Oracle projects out there who maybe sit along the more subjective side. So an Oracle can be seen as anyone putting information on the blockchain. But for me, I, I've been more interested in the, the more objective side of Oracles. So the ability to put data on the blockchain and have it consumed more or less instantly. So, so can you like explain to me the jump from like veterinary vet school to data APIs, I mean, that is I, like- I've just always been that, interested in technology. That That's a it's, really it's just seeing point. seeing smart contracts being used on the blockchain, but just being siloed, so not being able to access this external data. And when you look at existing Web2 apps, they're really a connection of APIs meshed together. So Uber is a, a payments API, it's a location API, it's a communication API, and it's a maps API. And you, you net those together and you have this multi-billion dollar um, company. So it kind of gets you thinking, why can't you build these on Web3? Why can't you have a truly decentralized censorship resistant version of Uber? And it's because the APIs aren't there. So like blockchain developers just don't have access to this kind of information. So we've always been passionate about trying to get this kind of data and in fact, all kinds of data on blockchain in a form that developers can use. 
And then that, I think, is what will truly lead to the next generation of dApps being created. It's not necessarily something where increasing TPS or the other <laughs> metrics that blockchain developers normally use is what's throttling dApp creation at the moment. I think it's, it's the availability of data. So that's kind awesome. of what... That, that's the, so, my thesis. That's what's got me into this in 2017, 2018. And originally then we built a marketplace or I and a few of my other friends went on to found um, API3. That's one of the companies who founded it. We launched a marketplace back in 2019 for smart contract developers on Ethereum, which offered different kinds of API data called Honeycomb. Um, and that taught us a lot about the barriers in getting APIs on the blockchain and the problems around it. And that eventually is what led us to creating API3. Cool. So um, why, why don't you just go ahead and give everybody the whole presentation of, of I don't know what you've got prepared, if you're, if you're going to be presenting API 3 and all of its products and services, or just focusing on AirNode or whatever, but you got about uh, 35 minutes uh, to, to go through your presentation. You can do it relaxed. I'm sure it'll be plenty of time. Um, and then we can, we can talk about your bounties. Uh, yeah. and, and any questions that I have, um, go for it. Cool. Um, yeah, so I don't think it'll take 35 minutes, but let me share my screen. Well, just go relaxed. I can tell you're a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah, so I've just, just had a big coffee. Take your time. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep, we're good. Okay, perfect. So the main thesis behind API3 is, like I was just saying, we want to create a kind of environment where there are lots of decentralized APIs available for Web3 developers. This is kind of what I was discussing earlier. Really, we see smart contracts needing reliable, real-world data to provide meaningful services. And if you look at the DeFi apps at the moment, it's $60 billion of TVL is currently contained within smart contracts, just in DeFi. And this is a small subset of real world data. This is essentially only crypto price data and a little bit of commodities data. There are other use cases out there that can be touched upon, but don't really have much in production at the moment. So insurance, supply chain, enterprise, internet of things, governments, and the list goes on. And the problem at the moment is that these APIs can't be directly accessed by smart contracts. Um, an API is an application programming interface. It's essentially something that allows software to fetch any data or also trigger off-chain events. So when I say using APIs, this can be both getting data from it and also actioning a real-world output. So sending a letter, sending a package, they can all be done programmatically through APIs as well. Smart contracts can't interact with them directly, and this is what leads people on to the Oracle problem. Um, the Oracle problem classically is a three-party problem. So you have the data source, you have the blockchain, and the Oracle problem supposes that then there has to be a third party who puts data, who gets data from the source and puts it on the blockchain. And it basically states that you have to then trust this third party unless there's a way of doing it trustlessly. And this is the way that classic Oracle projects have done it. So Chainlink, Band, Teller, Witnet, they all use various different ways of abstracting away the fact that a third party can interfere with the data. So really, the Oracle problem we think is actually miscomposed. The Oracle problem essentially is the API connectivity problem. All of the Oracle projects currently are calling data from APIs and then there's some kind of aggregation process or some process that occurs between these third-party oracles to put it on chain to make sure they're not interfering and there are no Sybil attacks. And then that goes on chain. Whereas actually, when you recompose it, the problem is the inability for dApps to receive services and data from traditional APIs in a decentralized way. And actually, you can solve a lot of the problems associated with these oracles if you can get the data provider themselves to run the oracle because then you don't have third parties to trust, you don't have third parties to pay, and you don't have this Sybil attack risk that you have to abstract away. And the best way of describing API 3 is that it's a collaborative effort to build, maintain, and manage these APIs, and also then aggregate these APIs into data feeds, which we call the APIs at scale. So this way, we'll provide fully decentralized data with quantifiable security for projects that need it. And these are the problems that we had with current projects, really. They, 
the governance of data feeds is centralized, opaque. There's no oversight over it. The oracles are operated by these third parties and you don't actually know how secure a data feed is for the amount of TVL that it contains. There's no information, for instance, that say a data feed is served by X node serving Y APIs. That doesn't actually tell you how much value can be secured by it. Um, there's just not information, not enough information there for it. So the problem with centralized data feed governance, for instance, is that if the governor is able to remove oracles from a data feed or add oracles on, then they can actually have control over this data feed. They could remove all the oracles from it and put their own oracle on and report whatever they wanted. So it's a point of trust, basically. And what's worth mentioning is, is why they have to do this. It's you can't really see a data feed as being like a smart contract. So you can't create a data feed, write it saying, call this API, this endpoint, uh, this endpoint from this API, and deploy it and expect it to work in perpetuity because API providers can change their specs. New API providers might emerge that provide a, a kind of objectively better quality data, or API providers might go offline or go bust. So there has to be an entity with oversight over it. And current projects just have the company who operates the Oracle project doing it. But there's no visibility as to the decisions they're making. Um, there's no public voting. There's no trustlessness there at all. So effectively, you're, you're trusting a single party that they won't interfere with your data feed. And we had a problem with that because essentially, to me, that's not solving the Oracle problem if you're still trusting that someone isn't going to misreport the data that your DAP uses. The second problem we set to solve is this kind of problem of having third party Oracles. These third party oracles expose any data feeds or even any single APIs to middleware attacks. So things like civil attacks and the node operators colluding to slightly misreport. This also decreases the transparency of the feed. So for instance, in some Oracle projects feeds at the moment, you can only see where the like you can only see the Oracle that reports the data. You don't actually follow that back through to the API, so through to the data source. So you might have five, seven oracles but you can't tell that they're actually all using different APIs. They might only be using one or two or one, and there's actually no way of testing that, which also makes it harder from a risk assessment point of view. I'm uh, sorry, the other thing I should mention here is that when you have these middlemen, so these third party nodes, they're not doing this just because they are, they believe in trustlessness. They're doing it to make money. So if you're relying on third party oracles, you tend to end up having to pay them to do their job as well. So when we're talking about having API providers put the data on chain, this ends up being cheaper because you're not paying the middlemen directly and the API provider can push directly on chain. So you're also saving gas costs of having to aggregate between multiple third party nodes. And this is what I was touching on earlier. It's about quantifiable security. Um, we think decentralized Oracle networks shouldn't be treated as completely trustless. There are lots of problems that they can do. So um, for example, here we put technical malfunctions, malicious oracles, malicious data sources, scaling solution malfunctions can all be problems that you can find with these kind of Oracle projects. So we believe that we should quantify the amount that's secured by an Oracle project so that people can look at their risk and assess how much they'd lose in the event that something happened. And if they're not happy with that, then they can look and uh, take their TVL elsewhere. So API 3 aims to provide smart contract developers with data feeds that solve all of these issues. So the first point here is that we use first party oracles. Um, we have Airnode, which is our oracle. It's run by API providers. And this gives fewer attack surfaces. So for instance, we have an API called Finage, who we're providing for the hackathon. Uh, Finage provides crypto price data, commodities data, Forex data, and they're able to put this data directly on chain through Airnode. So you don't need redundant nodes. You don't need nodes to aggregate between. You can call data directly from the endpoints on the API, and it's served on the chain. This saves gas. Um, you don't need to aggregate between the nodes, as mentioned. And also, there's no separate fees for those nodes. In order to get an API provider to run a node, we've had to design it in a very particular way. And the aim here, as I was mentioning before, is to try to improve the adoption of um, of external data for blockchain in the whole and try to get as many data sources to be able to provide data to blockchain projects. So we've had to design 
this node very carefully and we've worked with API providers for a while because like, since 2018, we've been building a marketplace on Ethereum for it. So we kind of know the specs and we know what they're happy to run. So Anode has been designed around this. The first point is it's set and forget. So you don't really have to know much about how it works or know anything extra to deploy it and to operate it. Uh, this kind of an example of this was we tested a deployment five months ago, I think, and then went back to it without having done any maintenance and it was still running perfectly well. And this also goes back to it being maintenance free. It's stateless. So it's very resilient against any problems that require a node operator to intervene. And it's built on pay as you go services, which means that if it's not used, it's not costing you anything. So API providers can deploy an air node knowing that if they're not immediately receiving any demand for it, it still isn't going to cost them anything at all. The last point is it's cryptocurrency free for data providers. Because although some crypto price providers might be happy with this, we want to get as many different data sources on the blockchain as possible. And some of the very traditional API providers aren't going to want to have to maintain wallets to top up with Ethereum, with RSK, with various different tokens. It causes problems for them with compliance, and with AML, and generally it's, it's quite a significant barrier for them to get over. With Airnode, the requester covers all the gas costs and the API providers can take payment for access in whatever form they want. So people can take money in fiat and then they can allow people to access the API and they're not touching crypto at all for that process. And it's kind of, although ultimately we want people to become more involved in blockchain, we think it's easiest to get them involved bit by bit. And this is a very good introduction, we feel. The last point and the kind of the big differentiator with API3 and the other projects is that we're going for full decentralized governance. So we have um, we have a DAO that's just finished its final audit. Um, it's governed by a DAO and it'll be decentralizing the governance of the APIs and the single APIs and the API3 project as a whole. The way this project will work is that people who have API3 tokens will be able to stake them in a staking pool. And this staking pool then gives them governance rights in proportion to how many tokens they have staked. So this basically means that the, the more API3 tokens you have, the more of a say you have in it, but the staking is also used to collateralize the quantifiable security. And what this means is that if there's a project with the data feeds, or sorry, if there's a problem with the data feeds or with the other data provided by API3, there can be a kind of decentralized insurance procedure so that the users who suffer the losses don't lose out directly. And this goes back to the quantifiable insurance. This means that we can, for a certain project, say we will insure up to X dollars TVL. And then the project knows that any Oracle or data problems that cover up to that amount will be covered by API3. This is also done through a third party arbitration process. So Kleros is an example arbitrator. Um, we'll be launching with them. And that also further decentralizes the process of claims. So you don't have to rely on the DAO saying, yes, we want to pay out because we had a problem with the data feeds. That's taken away from our control. Um, we, through this also, it incentivizes correct governance because if you let anybody with tokens govern, you run the risk of them then creating problems and trying to behave maliciously. Here, if that happens, they do lose their tokens. So that's guarded against. And that's just about the governance token that I was describing. So I'll go on to the prizes now we're doing. What we really want with this hackathon is we want to see people building interesting things using Airnode enabled APIs. We want to see if anybody has suggestions for how the protocol can be improved, we'd be happy for them to try and do that. And that's one of the categories for our prizes as well. And the other thing we'd like is because we're starting to add these APIs, we want to see people who can create something amazing with an existing project. So for instance, people might look at using the Finnage API, which has crypto prices to create a limit order DAP, which would work for Uniswap. So these kind of things can be fairly easily done and we'd really like to see what people can do with it. Um, we're getting to the point now where these APIs are starting to be deployed. So Sovereign is the first hackathon that we're doing. It, it seemed to work very well for timing and also we're we're very passionate about making data available to as many blockchains as possible because Bitcoin is kind of the daddy of all blockchains. The possibility of helping bring data to a side chain of Bitcoin was, was really interesting for us. And that's everything.
Let me go back. Cool. To Why don't you pop over to to the to the hackathon page, uh, to to the uh, Gitcoin page? Okay. And uh, yeah, let's look at your bounties there. If you yeah. want to be any so, little more clear about the bounties? I see that there's already two projects that have. Uh, I think. I think we actually have three so far, which is really good. It's nice to see some early interest. Yeah, so far our prize is, the first prize is $25,000, second prize is $15,000, third is $5,000, and there's a judge's choice prize of $5,000 that could be awarded to other things that we find very interesting. For all of this as well, there's a focus on um, trying to get something production ready. So if people create something here that we think would make a very good production ready candidate, then there's a grant for $100,000 as well that we can award to them. We really want to see people using these and people building something that, that is used. Um, the main prizes here, um, these prizes aren't in any specific subcategories. So we'll just be giving it to, the, to what we deem as the best, second best and third best project, and then we'll collaborate with the choice as well. Um, so you can do any one of these individual criteria or rule three, however you feel is best. Um, throughout all of this, we have a channel on the Sovereign Discord, and we also have a channel in our own Discord. We'll be monitoring both of those. So whatever is e easiest for you to ask questions in, we will happily do that. And I think the Sovereign one is probably best for most people. Awesome. Um, why don't you do, you got some, plenty of time uh, to do some deeper dive into, into AirNode, um, if you'd like to do that. See if I have a deck on AirNode. I so I'm I'm not a developer, so the actual technical side of things is less good. Me Let's either. See if I get my AirNode deck. <laughs> okay. Okay, yep, if we could share screen again, I'll go through a few slides about AirNode. Okay, so as kind of mentioned before, AirNode's a simple open source Web3 API gateway. It allows API providers to, collect, to connect to blockchains without active management or using third parties. And when we say blockchains, AirNode's been designed to be blockchain agnostic from the start. So currently, AirNode will work with more or less any EVM-compatible blockchain. As an example here, um, when the business development team at Sovereithon got in touch with me about um, Sovereithon, we were able to test and deploy AirNode onto Rootstock within 24 hours and have it able to send data there. So it's been designed in a way that once a blockchain is integrated, every API provider running AirNode is then able to push data to that blockchain. So for example, Finage and Heimdall are, are two API providers who we're integrating for Sovereithon, but they'll also be available on the other blockchains AirNode supports eventually. Um, it's designed to be deployed without any blockchain specific know-how by the API provider using the same cloud provider. And the same cloud provider part is pretty important because it means that AirNode will have the same uptime as the API provider itself. And the importance of that is that it means if the API provider is down, AirNode will also be down, but there is no point having an AirNode that's operational that's not able to serve data. And if the API provider is up and the API is working, AirNode will also be working. So that's why we wanted to, uh, API providers to be able to deploy it in exactly the same way as their APIs are deployed. The key thing here as well is the API provider is in full control of their data. No third parties can access it without their consent. And AirNode's also been audited to be GDPR compliant. So for big enterprises providing data, they know that it's not going to go through third party middlemen who might not have GDPR audits, might not have data security in place. It will be just used by them and whoever they want directly to use their data. Um, these are the kind of specs that we have designed to make sure that API providers are willing 
to run it. Um, it's quick to set up. You can deploy it in three minutes, actually. It's set and forget. Like I mentioned, you can once deployed, it can operate for months without needing any extra changes. Maintenance free, stateless, so that any any loss of state by the blockchain itself will normally be self-healed within a minute. So then the data will be pushed after that. Free to deploy. Um, I think we, we tested it. I think you needed, you could deploy up something like 22 air nodes simultaneously um, under AWS free tier. So it really is pretty light and easy to maintain and cryptocurrency free for people to use. Well, for the API provider side. And this is the main points that we always bring up with the API providers. Um, they tend to see it and they should see it as expanding their addressable market. Um, API providers aren't they're very knowledgeable about cloud technology and how everything works there. So what we're offering basically is a way for them to wrap their API in a way that it can be used by this whole new landscape of consumers. <coughs> and really, the, when it comes to the market size, I, I think when you look at $60 billion TVL for DeFi, just based on price data, when you expand that to other possible addressable verticals, I think really there's a huge use case here. And a lot of API providers are very interested in doing that. So that's the entirety of my extra air node deck. Let me stop sharing. So um, we're really interested in anybody who's looking to build any projects on Airnode with API 3. One of the other categories that we've offered a surprise category is people who are looking to integrate an API themselves. We've documented all of this process. It involves creating what's called an Oracle integration specs. This is very similar to the kind of um, the data specs that people use to create an open, well, sorry, it's very similar to open API specs and it's designed to be directly transferable. So we want to see people who see a data source out there that they're interested in getting online, either reaching out and helping the data provider integrate Airnode or doing it themselves as a third party kind of proof of concept. Although it doesn't have the same security guarantees for a hackathon, it, it can create some interesting use cases anyway. But like I say, we have two API providers already there for you. So I've been through briefly what Finage does. Heimdall is another interesting API. They provide social scoring for different crypto projects. So a kind of example project we've given that could be created here is a social score based um, rebalancing portfolio, basically. So almost like a kind of balancer that adjusts the weights of different projects based on their social scoring. So that way, if, um, if, a, if a project suddenly emerges that gets a lot of organic adoption, then you might be able to pick up on that a bit earlier. I can imagine that platform. being very useful in all of the DAO space that's happening in Ethereum. And there's so many, there's so many different uh, uh, forks and implementations from Moloch DAO uh, and Meta Cartel. Uh, there's a huge ecosystem there uh, of people that are holding tokens in each other uh, and using tokens for access. Uh, and so there's there's already so a social weighting happening uh, in, in many projects. Also for NFTs, I can imagine this would be a huge use case that we're gonna be seeing. Uh, you're gonna need NFTs for access to platforms or access to content or access to all kinds of, of different things. Uh, it's gonna be a huge, huge market of, of uh, reputation uh, monetization, so to speak, going yeah. on in the next, in the next year or so. It's going to be definitely a place where, where API, uh, APIs can play a large role. For yeah, sure. definitely. And this is, these are two sort of early APIs that we're offering for this hackathon. We intend for there to be orders of magnitude more available down the line. So um, these early implementations as well, if there are any other pieces of data or any other data providers people are looking for for this, they're welcome to reach out and we can always see if we can help out there. So Awesome. Then, and on the whole, we're really willing to like, try and help people wherever we can. Um, our integration engineers are very good. And we're gonna try, we've tried to work on the documentation quite a lot for this. And we think we'll probably do a tutorial video as well, just to explain. Yeah, cool, just, just, just let me know, we can, we can put it in the schedule, we can stream it on the channel. Uh, we got six weeks, we can, you know, we can do multiple things, workshops, if you wanna schedule that, reach out to the community, um, we can organize that. and. Uh, doesn't have to be a one-off thing. I, I thought it was a good place to be an introduction. Also, you know, you have on, uh, uh, if, if you go to sovereign.sovereign.app as a, as a user and you click on partners, 
There's also there a link to, uh, to a video booth. You can schedule a time to talk with the API3 guys. Uh, we have ongoing uh, you know, ability for, for breakout rooms. Uh, so communications channels are open and uh, we'll do our best to, to integrate with anybody that wants to have help with, with what it is that they're doing. Um, we're all here as a team, uh, multiple people to assist people to build things. Um, this is our way of reaching out to and finding new talent. Uh, this is not something that we see either as API 3 or as, or as Sovereign that we see as a one-off sort of thing. This is the beginning of building relationships uh, and, and, and assisting development of products that, that interface with, with our product. So um, go check yeah. out the bounties. <laughs> uh, get in touch with us on Discord. Uh, ping us on any channels, uh, and we'll do our best to, to help you guys uh, find a way that would be meaningful to build a product. Uh, you know, you don't have to stab in the dark, right? You can ask us what it is that we want. Uh, it's a good thing to be familiar with our GitHub repo as well, our smart contracts, look at what it is that we're doing. We also have, uh, we also have API 3. We also have API uh, bounty listed uh, as in addition to, to API 3s. Um, bounty so basically anything that we can do price data on uh we're looking at and uh if you've got teams that are uh you know you have ui ux front end people on your team we're very very interested in that so this can be uh this can be an onboard into a longer term relationship with uh, longer term compensation in the form of the initial uh, bounties the grants and even potentially uh, project launch uh on origins uh with uh with a token, uh, if anybody has a business use case uh, that's going to help expand the, the the ecosystem, then uh, both of our teams are here to help you guys doing that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's what it's all about. It's not just like come and hack something and get some money. It's come and show us the first MVP, uh, and and we know the software development takes time, uh, but if you don't start somewhere, <laughs> you never really get anywhere. Uh, but we uh, we have capital. To, to assist these type of things being implemented. So uh, take opportunity of that. Yeah, I think as well, like some of the times a lot of people are confused about different aspects of data and how best to use data and how to integrate it. So if you need any help there, any suggestions, you're welcome to reach out. I'm happy to chat to you. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, and thanks that. for partnering with the Thon, man. It's uh, yeah. great to meet you and, and uh, look forward uh, to developing this moving forward and integrations with our platform in or outside of the hackathon. Uh, hopefully we'll be seeing each other more often, Dave. Yeah, exactly. Thanks very much cool. for your time anyway. I appreciate it. All right. Cheers.